welcome to Classical Education, a podcast for those who believe in rediscovering the art of asking questions, engaging in conversation, and attending to the ideas at the heart of well-ordered teaching and learning. I invite you to join me on a journey in pursuit of the true, the good, and the beautiful as a participant in the great conversation and listen to the many voices coming from the world of classical education. Okay. My guest today is Anne-Marie Carter, and she is from uh, Founders in Tyler, Texas. And we have a lot to share today about uh, Book of Centuries, making Book of Centuries. And so we have lots of resources. She's going to, we're doing this on YouTube. So if you're in the car listening, you're going to want to also watch the video because she's going to share lots of examples of students' work. And um, I would like Amory to tell a little bit about herself and how she got into classical education. We have some mutual connections that mm -hmm. she'll share. And most of you listeners know who Kiernan Fiore is. And she did our podcast episode on neoclassical education. And so she has a relationship with Kiernan and we'll share that. So Anne-Marie, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having me. I have really enjoyed the podcast and the Facebook community. So I'm excited to be here. Yeah, well, um, I'm, I'm, I'm excited cool. to hear your, I'm really excited to hear and show our listeners examples of the work your students are doing because you've done an amazing Thank job. You. I've been so impressed with the work that you have done at the school. And so I'm excited. So go ahead and share. Sorry. Yeah. So um, I'm, I'm Anna Marie Carter. I studied elementary education at University of North Texas. Um, and so I was not raised with classical. I did not uh, go to a classical school. I went to a public high school. Um, I knew something was missing. I studied under all of the most progressive ideas that changed every semester. Um, and then I taught in the districts for two years. I taught fifth grade and I quite despised um, how we were intended to teach them. It was all scripted. Um, there was no history. Uh, everything was, uh, it was not what I thought teaching was going to be. Um, and I was very disillusioned. My husband studied philosophy and he was at Founders Classical of Mesquite. He wasn't sure if he was gonna be a teacher. Now, of course, he's a headmaster and this is his whole life. Um, but I, they needed a music teacher and that is another passion of mine. And so I was like, this is a wonderful opportunity that I can't miss up on. Um, so I went over to Founders Classical and had knew nothing about classical education, uh, was learning as I was going and absolutely fell in love. I mean, I was fully indoctrinated in <laughs> what you're doing in the districts. And then I came over and it, I was like a, a, a new convert. I was like, have you heard about <laughs> classical education? Like this is the best thing ever. Um, and one of the things that I really, really fell in love with classical education for was how it taught history because I felt so neglected in that area of my life growing up. I Oh, did not sure. Know. It was social yeah. studies. Oh, yeah, social studies. <laughs> it wasn't history. <laughs> and we just learned history in the, like, in concepts and stories, like not stories. I wish it were stories, um, just subjects. It was. Well, it was like tidbits of stories within like a textbook. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Um, and, and just little projects here and there, which the projects were the things that I remembered, if I'm being honest. Um, but I never had an idea of this linear look and this great story. Uh, and I had to teach the core knowledge curriculum, which is based in that we have a cycle. Um, and I was teaching third through eighth grade at the time. I've now taught every single grade of music. <laughs> and then I've taught eighth grade art. Um, and I love it all, but I, I was teaching third through eighth grade at the time and learning so much about art and music or music history, but also art history through music history, learning about history in general in ways that are embarrassing to say because <laughs> I didn't know them before. Right. And I began to have one of my first regrets in life because I had lived a pretty regret, regretless life, um, 
And I realized, I was like, man, I was missing out. I wish I had had this education. I wish I had gone to school and gotten a liberal arts degree or something like Mm -hmm. that, um, or studied music or art. I was, you know, told that I had to study elementary education if I wanted a job in education. And here my husband is with a role above mine in education and he didn't, he didn't have an education degree but a philosophy degree. And some of the most fantastic teachers I have ever come across did not have that degree. Kiernan, Jillian, um, Nathan Sadasman, like they're, they're incredible teachers out there that Mm -hmm. my husband, (laughs) that I was like, wow, you do not need this. Yeah. to have good material to work with. And so I'm excited that we're going to be studying um, or we're going to be talking about the book of centuries because I feel like it does kind of bring me back to what first made me fall in love with classical education um, is this view of history. And I didn't start doing these book of centuries until last year. Um, But I, you know, it's, this is another piece of the puzzle that has been missing. And I'm excited that it's part of my life now. Yeah, I would like you to tell our listeners a little bit about what you told me off air with uh, Charlotte Mason and how how she impacted you and how Kiernan introduced you, Kiernan and Jillian introduced you to her. Yes, yes. So in starting at Founders Classical, uh, I, you know, I'm coming from this very progressive district area, and I also think myself. Um, to know more because I've I've studied in this yeah. and I've been teaching and everybody else is new. Um, it was I was quickly humbled in that. All I needed to do was watch one class and be like, oh, never mind. <laughs> I do not know what I'm talking about at all. This is better. Um, but I had in falling in love with classical education. It was the culture. It was the conversation. It was. Um, the history, it was all of these, you know, Aristotelian ideas, these these Greek classical ideas. And the part that I was kind of skeptical on was the extreme rigidity. And I still love rigor. Rigor mm-hmm. is wonderful. Um, but I felt as though the rigidity was sort of killing some of the joy. Um, And I was willing to do it. I was willing to stick with it because I saw the fruits of everything else. And I was having conversations with kids um, who came from awful backgrounds. And they are, you know, asking me whether I feel as though I'm more of a Spartan or more of an Athenian. And I can't answer because I didn't have that history. I'm like the... Ooh, that is you so cute. <laughs> nothing. Yeah. I was raised in this wealthy area, and you have a better gift than I have been raised with. Like, cherish that. So, anyway, I'm sorry. I'm like going off on that, but that's cute. I, felt as though, I, I didn't even know there was something missing, but I did have questions. I was like, I don't know about this. I don't know about that. Um, and then we started reading Consider This by Karen Glass and just a little like book club with Kiernan and Jillian. And I, you know, I'd been like Charlotte Mason. Oh, they, they think they're classical, but they're not classical. Also still coming from my pride that I'm, I think I know what I'm talking about. I don't. Um, And she was like, no, this is like, read this, just read it. We'll talk about it. And I fell in love. I think that Charlotte Mason completes the puzzle of what classical education looks like. Um, that you have to have, you have to, oh, and what she says is, I need to bring up this quote, um, because I found it so beautiful. So this is what, sorry, this is what um, Charlotte Mason, there we go. Okay, so this is what she says about how history is taught. Perhaps the gravest defect in school curricula is that they fail to give a comprehensive, intelligent, and interesting introduction to history. To leave off or even begin with the history of our own country is fatal. 
We cannot live sanely unless we know what that other people, peoples are as we are with a difference, that their history is as ours with a difference, that they too have been represented by their poets and their artists, that they too have their literature and their national life. We have been asleep and our awakening is rather terrible. And then she goes on, the people whom we have not taught to rise upon us in their ignorance in the rabble as the world were now but to begin antiquity forgot custom not known they cry choose we from hamlet heaven help their choice for choosing is indeed with them and little did they know of these two ratifiers and props of every present word and action antiquity and custom it is never too late to mend but we may not delay to offer such a liberal and generous diet of history to every child in the country as shall give weight to his decisions consideration to his actions and stability to his conduct, that stability, the lack of which has plunged us into many a stormy sea of unrest, um, <laughs> which is a strong statement, yeah. and I, I love it. But she said that through making these books, the imagination is warmed, which is such a beautiful way to say it. And we have to see all of the history that has brought us here to not just understand our world, but also understand how we are meant to teach mm -hmm. and what is worth. So in that section, what book, which one of Charlotte Mason's volumes, what was that? I do not know. I, I, so I did not read that from, I'll, I'll give credit to, this is from Charlotte okay. Mason's poetry. Yeah, um, I, I'll actually find the source and I'll put it in the show notes. That would be awesome. Yeah. Yes, thank you. And then uh, also, also she, and it could have even been one of her newsletters, like the PNEU letters rather than one of her volumes. But is she specifically talking about also making Book of Centuries there? Um, I don't know if she is talking about, I, I think she might be. This is more about her talking about history. Now, she started doing the Book of Centuries because she and her students and some of her colleagues and their students would go to the British Museum um, and they had a book with them that they would go through and make these connections with the art pieces and with the artifacts and then put those together. And then they, they called it, I, I can find what they called it. They didn't call it a book of centuries before, um, but she adapted this because she wanted it to be something that was not just used in the museum, um, but was used in everyday life and was something that you could just bring along with you. And I, I think that's a really neat start. So tell our listeners how you got started in Book of Centuries. How long have you been doing it? Um, how did your students respond at the beginning and how are they doing now? How have they changed from doing this book of centuries and we're going to show the t uh, the listeners some examples but tell us kind of the story of how you've rolled that out and what where you are today well as a lover of art and music i am aesthetically intrigued <laughs> by things I, I love beauty and i was on i wish i could tell you which blog i was on and which whose instagram i was looking at at the time um but she was talking about her own children she was a homeschooler and she was talking about her own children's commonplace books and book of centuries and they had them in this beautiful leather bound sort of take along uh, journal and i was like why have i never heard of this that's brilliant that makes all the sense in the world and so i started looking into it um i knew i was not in a place where we would be i have many students um and we're in a public sphere the funding for what we would want to do would not be there uh, as far as buying Book of Centuries books. Uh, so I thought I'm going to make something that works for my class and our students. Uh, in eighth grade, I teach pretty much, I do a big review of art and music history together. Um, and then we move into American art and history. And that's the rest of the year, which has been really fun. Uh, so I really shaped our, my own use of the Book of Centuries around how I teach the class. 
Um, and we looked at the eras. Generally, a book of centuries is going to have a century per page. She wants us to be able to look at a page and just kind of get some ideas of what that century looked like. Uh, in teaching music, I have periods that I look at mm -hmm. and art as well. Um, so that's how I changed our book of centuries is I made them more. I'm so sorry for that notification not really sure how to turn it off um in making ours i i put it into ancient greece renaissance baroque classical romantic uh that's that's how and then we even got to make up names for what we think this generation is going to be called um and i let the students decide i gave a suggestion we talked about what does the past 100 years look like or the past 20 years 50 years and most of us have landed on the age of the internet a lot of them were pretty <laughs> nihilistic and they were like the age of doom the, it's the end well it is i mean we are very much influenced by nihilism yes. yeah 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 no it, i mean that's that's very fair you'll certainly see that in my kids Book of centuries as well some of them have a lot of hope and some of them the ending pages are just doom and i'm like you can continue these pages onward um but yeah so that is how i got started in doing the book of centuries with my students at first and i've learned a lot and i'm I've, over the past two years and i'm sure there i will learn more in the coming years um my first year i tried to just throw all this information at them and <laughs> expect that they get it. And I really rushed it. Um, and it wasn't, it wasn't the best way. Um, I, I felt as though they really hated the book of centuries because I did that. Um, so this past year in my review, I really dedicated the time at the beginning to first make our book of centuries set it all up and then we spent time each week putting the information into it um and i also made sure that i had printed pieces of artwork that were essential to that period and understanding it that were beautiful and in color um, that could make it look really nice because the year before i had them all in black and white and I felt it just made them look a little trashier. I mean, you do what you can, um, but that was what I noticed with ours. So let me clarify. So when you first implemented it, you didn't have them set up their books. And how was that a hindrance? I did have them. I, I had them set up their books and make their books all in one, like, one to two week period. Mm -hmm. It was just like, bam. Mm -hmm. We're all doing this right now. And I felt as though they didn't absorb the history like they needed to. And they oh, weren't. You ha so you had that. them enter things in the periods before they learned them? They had learned these things. They should have learned these things in other grades. Um, but yes, uh, kind of before they learned them in my class. Okay. Um, and there wasn't a, it was, it was just a speedy, speedy review. Uh, okay. And, and that was. I think that was one of the great downfalls. Okay, so how oh, are you do? How did you? Yeah, so to explain a little bit for our listeners how you did it differently this time. So this year, I had them just physically set up their books, mm -hmm. and then we took time in each period. So, like today, where when we started at the at the beginning, because as a teacher anyway, I like to do a review over. The highlights and the mm -hmm. dark parts of the history leading up because I feel as though there's no understanding of the art and the music that we're studying in this period if we don't know where it's coming from because so much of what we do is a reaction to oh, what sure. has come before us absolutely yeah that's good that's yeah. good that you're doing that review yeah that's good and so this has just beefed up the review but then it it I found it as a way to anchor them for the rest of the year to that information uh, that I was giving them. And before I had done this through little 
things and stuff. I'd be like classical king, you know, I would just have these keywords that they could pull back to so that when I was talking about the romantic period, I could uh, go back to this period and, and give them a keyword that I knew they would remember because we had practiced it and gone back and forth together uh, with it. But this has just added to that and given a visual um, book with them that they can mm -hmm. add to you and then turn back the pages. And I love that I can now say, because I don't have, I don't have a book that I come from and I actually to, to teach. And when it comes to art and music, I prefer more so with music. I prefer not to have a book that I teach from. That's just my own personal mm -hmm. uh, preference because I, I feel like it's something that's meant to be auditorily and visually experienced. Um, so when I am referring back to things, I'm like, what I'll ask the class a question. And if they don't immediately have it, I'm like, turn, look for it in your book of centuries. That's Find great. In your book of centuries. Okay. A couple more clarifying questions. What yeah. grades are you doing book of centuries with? You mentioned so eight. Right now I'm only doing it with eighth grade. Okay. Now I have, and I think, so Charlotte Mason recommends you start at 10. Mm -hmm. And I am just, my daughter is five and I'm like, oh, I want to start it now. Um, but I do see how there would be some disadvantages in starting quite that early. I think that, you know, maybe a nature book and commonplace book for, for beautiful things are good for, for her. But, uh, I think, you know, once you go into those middle school sort of years, then it's, it's a better time mm -hmm. um okay. but I just am doing it with eighth grade and then if other students have them and if they keep their book of centuries then I will reward them as house leader with points uh okay. from their classes and and that is my when I introduced this to my students I was like I want you to take these to your other classes and write down things that you were learning in those classes with it. I want you to make those connections. Our curriculum has been designed for you to make these connections together and to see our history as a whole and to see literature um, brought in with this. So celebrate that and put it in your book of centuries. And then I would reward them a house point if they had it in their book of centuries, just to kind of incentivize it um, mm -hmm. to a degree because some kids did it just out of the love, which is, of course, what you want. Um, but I think bringing in the culture of the school helped as well. Mm -hmm. um, and some kids did it a lot. And some kids just kept the book of centuries in my classroom and only brought it out when I made them bring it out. So sure, sure. everyone reacts to it differently. Um, there was another question I had. Um, oh. How many hours a week are you spending on Book of Centuries in class? That's a good question. I, so I spent a lot at the beginning of the year. So I would uh, teach a lecture on, um, let me, you know, let's bring up. So I teach, <laughs> I chose the one that's like a thousand years plus, um, but I would teach a lecture on the middle, the art and music of the middle ages. And then I would give them the, so this student actually drew all of his own, um, but I gave them artworks to put in there. Oh, so you um, give them the option where they could cut it and paste it or they could draw it themselves. Yeah. And, and, and Charlotte Mason, I think recommends that they draw it themselves. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm, giving them these master artworks sure. and it's not always easy to replicate that. Uh, so when it came to the artworks, if it was anything musical, uh, I did have them like, you know, draw a, a lyre, draw a, um, draw the like a stage with a proscenium, draw this instrument, etc. Uh, but then when it came to the artworks, I gave them the pieces That's of art. Because I wanted them to have that reference. Okay. And so, so the student who's deciding to draw it may have to do mm -hmm. that at home too. Like it might yeah. take longer than they could do in the classroom. 
And okay, so, so and that is that I would say if you as you know, whether you're, you're homeschooling or whether you're doing it in your class, I think this is a great tool for class. I think if you're homeschooling, you would probably want to invest in something quite hardy. Um, Mm -hmm. but you know, in a classroom, this worked really well for us. And so how held up pretty well. So how long do you normally dedicate the time for the book of century work? Because I know teachers are going to be like, I don't have time. Yes. Yeah. Um, I would, so to set up the book of centuries, it took us, I think about two days, two class periods. Okay. And then, um, some kids, it takes a little bit more, but it took us about two class periods to set it up. And then for each period I would teach a lecture. I think this helped us teach a lecture on it and you don't have to do it this way. If you have the dates in there, then they can just put it in. But I wanted them to walk away from my class with a piece of artwork in their hands that they could look back on, even if they never added another thing to it. Um, Of course, I want them to. Um, But anyway, I I spent, you know, would spend a day lecturing on a time period. And a day is not enough time to lecture on an entire uh, movement or time period. Uh, But I would lecture on it. And then the next day, I would give them a model of of mine where the sort of artworks and music pieces sit along with some of the key elements. Like if there was a big war during that time, um, big names. And then uh, I would also give them the artworks and they could paste them in there and they had to write next to them um, or as the student chose, went home and colored them. How many days a week? Day. How many so, days a week do you meet with your students? I meet with my students every day, okay. and this this has been the most wonderful year I would say, style wise of me teaching art and music because I did get to teach them together, uh, and that was really beneficial. Uh, talking to headmasters who are setting up art and music. Mm-hmm your husband would recommend that it's not an elective and that they have class every day. <laughs> oh, yes, 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 yes. And in every founder school I've, I've been at, I know they're, they're different. Some have like orchestra for music. And I studied, studied, I'm doing quotation marks if you can't see it and if you're not watching with us, um, music, my my whole life and didn't know any music history. It was all performance. Mm-hmm. It was all performance music. Um, it was all performance theater. I didn't know theater history. And then I unfortunately didn't study art, even though I had an inclination to it. And I wish I had. So we have set in our schedule that you have art and music and physical education through eighth grade and then you can begin to choose it as an elective after that okay so so k through eight Mm -hmm. they have music and art every day they so i wish that they had it k through five every day um but they do not so in in so much of that and i'm sure if there are any headmasters or you know people working with the hiring process they understand it's just it's difficult to finance that to to get enough art teachers and music teachers to be able to have them every single day because you have a whole school of students to pour in and out of those classes so in elementary school it's on a rotation um and then in middle school it's by semester but that is why i've loved this if you can find a teacher who does love both art and music even if they're stronger in one area um Test this out with one of your grades because it's worked really well for for my class. Um, I it, teach based on the time. So I used to teach just a semester of music uh, and then they would go to a semester of art. Some, uh-huh. some schools, I think, go art on this day, music on this day, art and, throughout the whole year, which would also be great. I liked teaching them every single day from a music perspective it's good to have them practicing from an art perspective. It's good to have them focusing on their artwork every single day. Um, but this year I got to teach art and music together. So I would go from, let me think of it, you know, this, after I did the book of centuries, we, we go into American 
music and art. And so I could go from an easy, easy example is to go from teaching blues and jazz to teaching um, the in the Harlem Renaissance blues, mm-hmm. blues, blues and jazz is a part of that, but then also teaching the artwork of that. Sure. Um, oh, that's so, so good. That is so good. And the architecture. Yes. Yes. <laughs> that's that's been fun as well. And I had to, this year was a little different because I was out April 11th with my darling baby, Claire May. So I had to organize my year and be like, what do I want to make sure that I get to teach? And what do I want to leave? And I was so blessed with my long-term sub because she is a lover of arts and theater and music. And so I was able to hand her architecture, photography, and uh, sculpture Mm -hmm. for the rest of the year. And she had already this love of the history of the the lessons that I was giving her and could look at it fully. So I, I did that a little differently. I did that based on subject, which isn't always my favorite. Um, I'd rather look at it from a historical perspective and then bring in the things. Now you guys are swing dancing. I like to keep my kids on their toes. Um, I have them sing in front of the class every year. I want them to sing by themselves in front of the class. And then I haven't gotten to do this with my um, current school yet, but I used to have my class work together to perform in front of the school as well. I think that's really important. Um, I, have, I have so many questions. I love everything you're saying. I want to back up a f- on a few things. One, yeah. for our listeners, I would recommend, and I don't know if your school's doing this, but for K-5, pro- mm-hmm. your school's probably doing it, but for K-5, this the the classrooms are self-contained, meaning there's one teacher, right? Yeah. Okay. And uh, so- I think in our uh, fourth and fifth grade, they have somewhat of a departmental some special okay but so for the most for the most part if they're self-contained then you can naturally easily and and should incorporate all of these ideas within your history uh talks and so this is one of the things i do when i do teacher training is how do you incorporate this in a self-contained classroom if you are a teacher i mean in those grades you're not a specialist you're a generalist And so you don't have to have it all perfect. It doesn't have to be exact. And that's kind of my background as a generalist. And that's almost what I want for my kids because I I tell people I didn't learn in high school. I studied not even theater. I just took theater was my life in in high school. And I want our kids to have a more broad you. Right. And so what this means is as a generalist, you're presenting the feast. When Charlotte Mason talks about the feast of ideas, you're presenting the feast of ideas. And that way they're getting this broad overview of what Charlotte Mason calls the pageant of history. Yes. So they're getting this broad, they're getting this broad overview of that pageantry Mm -hmm. so that then when they're teenagers, this is where it's very different than Montessori. When they're yes. that young, they don't yeah. know what they like because they haven't been given the pageant of history. Yes. So yes. At, when they're this young and they're coming up, you're giving them this feast and this broad pageant of history, and you're making them taste everything. You're mm-hmm. not allowing them to say, well, I don't want that and I don't want that. Well, they don't really know. They're not old enough and they haven't actually studied it deeply enough yeah. to know what they want. So then by and the time they get to life, high school. They love it. They yeah. love it. And you so don't then, have to do anything to it. They love it. No. And then when they get to high school, they've had this broad taste of everything Mm -hmm. so that then they know, okay, now I'm 14. I know what I like. And now that's why electives make sense in high school because they actually know what they like, what they know, what they're going towards. They know what, uh, what they want to kind of more focus on because there's so many beautiful things in life. You can't focus on all of it. You just can't. And so, um, as much as I would like, pressure to choose something there is to there. make that your career and that has that is another aspect of classical education that I've loved is that everything that we would say to kids before I was in classical education was this is going to prepare you for your job this is going right. to prepare you for your um for college this is going to prepare you for that and I love that I can look at my kids and say doesn't matter what you're going to do. This is going to make your life better. It's going to make you love many things and care about many things. And, and what I, what I have in my own life with classical education, what I've realized is 
there's so much to love and I want to love all of it. And I want to study all of it. That the only yeah. way I could possibly do that is to live to be 500 years old. Yes. Like, <laughs> and that's not I mean, going to happen. You're, you're I mean, I'm impressed. <laughs> so, you you still everything. No, there's so much I still don't know. And I still haven't read and I want to read. And I'm like, I want to read that book and that book and that book. But I'm like 53 years old. And I'm like, I have to kind of narrow down. What is it that I want to read in the next 40 years? Because right I don't now, have I enough time left. Baby. I've got babies all over me. <laughs> yeah. Well, audiobooks definitely help with getting through That's some true. of those books, you know, quicker. But I, 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 I guess what I want to say to our listeners is that if you're a if you're a K five teacher, self contained, just enjoy the mm-hmm. just enjoy digging into the uh, the music and the art of the era that you're teaching in history, and just find a way to incorporate it. Like just weave it in naturally. Five minutes here, twenty minutes. Like do a picture study of this beautiful. Uh, painting from the era we're studying in history, or if we're doing American history uh, and we're studying the Declaration of Independence in fourth or fifth grade, let's look at the John Trumbull painting of the signing of the Declaration of Independence. Let's listen to some patriotic music and let's kind of just immerse yeah. ourselves in the art and the reflective, well, how art has reflected that era for us. So I guess I just want to encourage those teachers who aren't at the level you're at in the higher grades to mm-hmm. not dismiss this and, and continue oh, to just I incorporate agree. it somehow. So, um, I think and recommends that in the lower grades, they have like a visual timeline on the wall. Yes. I think but that they, works. And then it's sort of teacher directed. I do think the younger grades around third grade can really actually start implementing book of centuries. We do that some training in that. And uh, yeah. it works really well um, to, to awesome. start and then kind of keep that book of centuries in the school and they add to it each year so that by the time they're done with fifth grade, they have a, a three year book of centuries they've worked on for three years. Um, so they project of the class. I love yes, that. They That's can something. do that. Um, but your periods are how long? So I know uh, that we're going to 15 minutes. 15 so minutes. I, I get about five hours with my students each so week. if i hear you correctly you, like, you, you'll, you'll do okay if you, going yeah. back to the elementary because that that's my that was more my background um i think my favorite area to teach is middle school that just fits that's what i like to me. <laughs> really yeah <laughs> i love middle school. yeah me too <laughs> they're so weird it's great and you're still the boss like you know they they they're, they know that they're a little lower <laughs> they aren't challenging you in that way um, high schoolers, they're like, oh, I'm an adult. I'm like, no, sweetie, it's okay. But anyway, going back to elementary school, I, when I taught music, I always collaborated with our teachers and asked to look at their scope and sequence for the year so that I could be teaching what would make sense. Because for, for second grade, um, you know, when we're studying Westward Expansion, then I would make sure that the songs that were already in the curriculum aligned with that and that when they're stuttering stuttering (laughs) i'm stuttering when they're studying uh the civil war then i'm bringing in the spirituals i'm bringing in the civil war songs and it's so funny because they're always like oh my gosh miss carter this is what we're just learning about i'm like no way (laughs) that is just crazy i love that that's exactly what you want you yes, have to tell your teacher that. That's just crazy. That's and so. <laughs> that's the spirit of classical education, right there. Nice. That's what you want. You want them to have those aha moments. Yes. Yeah, what we're learning. Like we don't. They they're going to gossip. So let's have them gossip about what we're learning. It's exciting. Uh, and so. That's, that was a poor, we don't want them to gossip anyway. I'm, I'm retracting that <laughs> statement. <laughs> we don't just allow this evil, but we can say that they're going to talk about what they're learning. We want them to do that. Um, but I, I think that I don't want to, this has worked really well for me as a music teacher and in now as an art teacher. This is my third year of teaching art. Um, but I've seen other music teachers and art teachers do different things and that works really well for them. And I, I don't think that my way is better. You know, I think that 
they have like I see what they're doing and I'm like wow I'm, I'm not doing that that's incredible um, look at what they're achieving with their students and so I think that's one of the joys in having a classical school is that the the teacher is the master of the classroom um, and it's not all scripted mm-hmm. praise the Lord it's not all scripted unless if it's phonics which I think is beautiful uh, but I think for those, if there is not a teacher, I think they're a, a teacher that is correlating what they're doing with what the class is doing. I think that the classroom teacher should look at what the music and art curriculum is and see if there is anything and try to make those connections um, and talk to their art teacher. When are you doing this? Oh, if you're not doing this, I might do this in my own class. Exactly. And I've talked yeah. to my teachers about, I don't know if anybody's done it yet, but if I was teaching, you know, first grade or kindergarten or second grade, I third grade, any of those grades, I would now, I would be incorporating a folk 15 where my students every day or every week would have 15 minutes perhaps of appreciating an artwork, learning a folk song, um, doing a craft perhaps from that time period that we're learning, uh, you know, learning some sayings from that time period, because then it's giving them that, that opportunity to fall in love with it. I agree a hundred percent. When I was writing curriculum for responsive ed and you're at a responsive ed school, yes, yeah. I think one we had to write the English curriculum uh, and the, the teaks, one of the teaks or the, requirements in the we had to meet all the takes one of the takes was to um follow instructions i'm like how do i put follow instructions in this classical curriculum well we knew they were studying the colonial area era and that one of the books they were reading was uh, one of the laurel ingles wilder books you know little house mm-hmm. on the prairie one of those yeah. so what we had them do and we created a whole instructions you know box one two three four how to make a corn husk doll i yeah and there- <laughs> to remember that forever because one the aspects of history that I remember learning was when we did the organ trail and we made quilts um I'm like oh yeah and the organ trail they were just making their own quilts you know (laughs) those are those things that I remember and then you also get that physical skill and something that they can go forward I mean middle schoolers today they have their hydro flask they have their stanley or whatever they have whatever is trendy but they also are crocheting every day at recess so when I, I'll tell you, I remember in fifth grade at the public school I went to, we, and this was back in the seventies. And so it wasn't the, the education in the seventies wasn't near, like it was actually decent at the school I went yes. to. <laughs> and, uh, I, you know, cause we had music class and, but I remember yeah. that the music teacher was teaching us colonial music. The gym teacher was teaching us square dancing oh, that we had yeah. a whole colonial week and we, we learned how to do candle dipping. We made these, um, I don't know, my dad ended up making a bunch of them. They're like a wooden block with nails across the top. And then you would weave yes. your yarn around mm-hmm. and we made scarves. And the, the yarn would kind of oh, like cool. fall. It was like a loom. And so we all made our own scarves. Anyhow, then we had a colonial day where we had food that was colonial. We all wore bonnets to school. <laughs> And we did square oh, dancing, love, you know. I mean, a lot of classical schools do um, like curriculum days and celebrations. I just love that so much. I think that is something that the students are always going to remember. I remember. Because I, yeah. <laughs> I remember we did um, oh, Ellis Island and some of us were the doctors and some of us were the, uh, you know, immigrants. And then I think during that time, we also had to talk to our parents about what our lineage was and make dolls that were so I had a little Scottish doll everybody always asks what I am I'm just I'm just white I'm just Scottish and English um and so it was it those are those are things that and they're, they're things of um love and creation that was what I was missing as an artist at the beginning of learning classical education um I was, it's like creativity was stifled it was it was discouraged um you know don't don't have your kids creatively writing. And I think that it was a pendulum swing from our students are never going to copy great works. They're only going to create from their own mind, which is no, like looking at Picasso's work, he, he create, he copied the greats before Mm -hmm. he created these unique, 
um, images that we see today, these unique pieces. Um, I want to say something about cubism. Yeah. So I have, I did, I went to Dallas Art Museum years ago. It's probably been 15 or 20 years. They had a Picasso exhibit and my cousin and I met there and oh, his art is so beautiful. And I remember mm -hmm. looking at all of it and getting like a real sense for his style, like yeah. taking in his style. And ever since then, I am so ruined. There is no other cubist. There's yeah. nobody okay. <laughs> like, no, oh, agree. Picasso is so much better at cubism. Like nobody mm -hmm. else can do it the I way he did it. Incorrectly right now, but Duchamp, Ducamp, his I is, I, I, he does a uh, nude descending on the staircase, descending the staircase. I don't but know that recalling one. Recalling names, which is another reason why I love Book of Century, Book of Centuries, but recalling names of things. <laughs> It's a struggle of mine. Oh. And so this is this is one of so I may have, you know, people who know their history and people who know their art correct me. Um and I would look at it if I was in the right place to to check it. Well, but yeah, no, we've some had cute we've had but, children and children when you're pregnant, you're there's a scientific evidence that your brain cells die. And so I have four kids and almost eight grandchildren now, so my brain cells are really dying. <laughs> oh my goodness. And I am fresh off it. I've I've this is, you know, I just had a baby. So I do feel like my brain is gone. My friends have even pointed out. They're like, wow. Well, <laughs> I'd, I'd, let's show our listeners some of the yeah. examples. We can try the screen sharing and you yeah. can show them some examples right, of well, your before students. Before we do the screen share, I'll just like. So these are some of my students. You can see there's a, a big variety in um what they look like and I really wanted them to make it their own because it's meant to be a keepsake for them as well um with this kid I he was he's so thoughtful in everything he does each letter is um oh, representing wow. a different sort of era or movement that's which beautiful. I thought was perfect. he's got um Toulouse Lautrec's uh cat there like it was just so creative that. Um, so I, I can do my screen share now. Okay, I'm sharing my screen now. So this, there you go. So these are, you just saw some of these I was talking about is, um, I let them choose their binding. And then we have our pages and we, we set them up. Um, and we have like prehistoric into ancient Egypt. These are different kids. Um, here, do they gonna... stitch those themselves or do you buy those already stitched, the pages? Oh, they, they make them fully themselves. Oh, we might need a, a, a link to put yes. in the show notes for instructions for how to make them. Oh, and I can show how to do it quickly. It's, it's not difficult. I wanted them to stitch, actually, as you're saying, stitch them. Um, but then there is a, I just, found that that wasn't the best use of the time. You were asking earlier, how much do I spend like a week on this? At the beginning, I spend a lot of time. Um, but then later on, it, after I've sort of concluded a, a time period, I will dedicate half of a day or a day to them putting their pictures in, uh, like cutting them out and putting them in, and then uh, taking their notes and putting that information so I already have a bunch of questions. You have yeah. them use rulers and make the lines, but yeah. you have a book of centuries that you have made as an example for the, each page. For yes. So I have, oh, I, and I, for my classroom, cause I have like 20 students. Um, it has helped to have it clean like uh, this okay. up on the screen. So I have um, each time period. Ah, uh, so you kind of show it, you, you project it up and then they hand draw it. I yes. understand. Okay. And we talk, you know, this isn't, it's not just copying. Um, we've talked about all these things and all the pieces of artwork, they know, uh, you know, they know the code of Hammurabi. Um, mm -hmm. they know all of these artworks. They know the, the different, um, you know, archaic classical Hellenistic, uh, styles of statues they know the um the columns and uh, I don't have the columns on this one but I do have them put them in they there. know more than I know I want to come take your class <laughs> oh that's so sweet I that's 
that's one of the things that I, I, I used to be insecure about how little I knew. Um, but I think it's, it's also helped me teach because I'm so excited about everything that I am learning, um, that I'm right there with them. I'm learning it with them. And I, I've seen people ask this question on the Facebook page too, as like homeschooling parents, like I wasn't raised classically. Am I going to be able to teach my kids in a classical way? Yes. Like you are learning alongside them. You're their master, but you're also learning alongside them. I love this. This is such a great visual of what Charlotte Mason means by the pageant of history. It's so good. This is such a fun piece, the, the Garden of Earthly Delights. Oh, I Delight. love both pieces. I love oh the, the Garden of oh, Earthly Delights I, is so disturbing. It such, is so disturbing. And I, we love talking about so it. It's so interesting. You, know, we, you and I love middle schoolers. And man, do the middle schoolers oh, love I'm the sure. disturbing. Oh, yeah. So I look at what this girl did with hers. Because it's a triptych. And so she, oh. uh, yes, she, she took hers and she folded it in. And and drew on the outside what what it looked like. And I also love this page for hers because she's Filipino. And she added in, this is what I encourage them to add in pieces that pieces of history that are important to them. Um yes, so I love that they that. can see where these pieces of importance, a personal importance, fit within the the great story of history. And so Ferdinand Magellan found founded discovered the Philippines this is right here I um, love and you that. can tell like she put shakes she highlighted here like I love Shakespeare and she loved the garden of earthly delights everybody um, it's such an amazing and interesting piece yeah I also I you know lots of different opinions here but in, in the middle school ages when it is a piece of artwork I I'm right there with that headmaster in Florida who got removed for showing this statue of David. Yes, I, I know was, exactly who you're talking there's, about. Yes, yeah. There's, there's a place, I wish I knew her name. Um, right I, do, now, but. I do, but I'm not going to say it. But I, yeah, I, I, it was funny. I, yeah. I was just uh, mentioning her to someone yesterday, but not in, in that regard. I just, that I knew, knew her. But yes, yeah, she, she I've did it. I, I can't, still can't even believe that she got, she got let go for that. It's just, it so shows sad. you. And that is one, I think that's a huge caution that we have to have um, as parents engaging in the, uh, in education with our, with our kids and with our communities and with our schools is that, uh, we want to protect our kids from everything. Um, but it is the more we go into controlling education as parents, um, we're taking away from society. I think like there is a degree to which we need to um, make sure it's being shaped in the right way. But they were wrong. <laughs> they were wrong for doing that. And you can't control every single aspect of education um, mm -hmm. unless if you are, even if you are homeschooling, I think that there is a degree to which, you know, some things are out of your hand. Here we have Picasso. Um, so Cindy Ingram, she, she I taught with her, she said this is her favorite piece of artwork. Um, and so she really got me into Picasso because I was able to see really the beauty and the desperation of this. Um, mm -hmm. And that he has a realistic aspect to it, despite how unrealistic it looks, how, how distorted it looks. There's that it's in black and white. He wanted it to look like the newspapers. Um, so anyway, this is, so this is my model. This is how I organized it. Obviously here we have thousands of years and then, uh, let me see classical period, probably which, which would be the, here we, here we have just a span of 60 years. Um, mm -hmm. because that's sort of how it got organized. Mm -hmm. as far as movements go. And I wanted to see that time. And I think there are uh, benefits to doing it different ways. Um, this is what, like I said, worked for my class. So um, this, this is how they would make it. And yes, you were asking about, do they use rulers? So yeah, I have them. That's the first thing I have them do is they set up, they make their books. And that's the thing that takes a couple of days. Is, Do you is tell them the measurements for how wide to make each line and all of that? To get into um, that? 
I give them a recommendation, but this student, she wanted to have space down here. So she chose to have these up here a little differently. And I, when we went on to, cause that's, this is another thing I did differently this year is um, I had, I gave, if you're at a core knowledge school, school you'll notice and honestly if you're at a school in america you'll notice that you have your history of the world and then you have your history of america um and i think it's important to see those intermingled yep. but then there's also so much that you learn about american history as it is ours that i i have a separate place for those things so then they can put the big things in here um but then Others. So when we go, this is when we're, we were talking about. Oh, um, yes. So this is the age of the internet. What but I, I, call I it. love that this student recognizes the problems with the yeah. era that we're in. That's really good. Oh, look, they have Barbie look, movie and, down and there. <laughs> my Green Day phase, dance moms, Bitcoin emos. <laughs> Did she they look up? This, did they look up that stuff on their own? Like, did you yes, tell them to uh -huh. find? Oh this wow! Is, this is all, and you know, from student to student, there is a different level of engagement. Um, one student really. Here we go. You know, these are the, and it's so interesting to me to um, see what how they, they were in yeah. from the past thirty years because we don't talk about that. Um, and so I'm like, oh wow. For them, for this student, it was Facebook, Netflix, 9-11, and COVID. Mm -hmm. uh, it's just very interesting. So this is another way, and I am um, I had I encouraged them to set it up this way for their America pages because I wanted to them to see the artworks in the line. Oh, so there's more great. details. Like you've mm -hmm. given them for the American history a little bit more more space to go down into the details i see yes i just have to thomas cole beautiful i had one i had one of my students fell in love romantically with thomas cole based on his artworks Aww. which is so funny um but yeah so this is this is what i encourage them to do for this but because this is such a personal uh piece you know this is their own thing that I want them to carry around with them, I let them have some say in how they did it. And this, I think this is the best way you could do it is re recreating them. Not everyone has the artistic skills that this, this boy did. Oh, um, wow. Yeah. He drew them instead of um, pasting yeah, them in. It's incredible. And I, I love looking at his. So here, this is, you know, prehistoric times. Um, I had one student put for prehistoric times fake history <laughs> and then real history because he oh, does that's he interesting does. <laughs> yeah you know one thing i'd like to point out for our listeners here is okay i did an episode with john Muir laws on uh, making nature journals and oh, wow. he talked a lot about how important it is not to praise them for like their the whether it's beautiful or not but just enter into this what you are noticing and i think and one of the things that's important is to like if you're going to be grading these and i don't know how you do it but like don't yeah. grade it for its beauty but grade it for its accuracy in terms of the student entering the details they noticed yes. and that if you're going to praise them at all you say oh you noticed you entered some very good details on that yeah. Rather than, oh, you drew a grid picture. because And you don't ever want to tell them that because the kids who don't know how to draw can feel very crushed and insecure. So I do like that you're allowing them to paste in a picture. One of the thoughts I had, Anna Marie, was, uh, so yeah. like when I was looking at your uh, Winslow Homer snap the whip, do you ever yes. give them, and this would cost probably too much, but do you ever give them little, like maybe three or four different paintings from that and let them choose which one they want to put in there? In their oh, I notebook. love that idea. So, in um, other words, you could do "Snap the Whip." You could do one of his uh, Caribbean paintings. That, yeah, uh, those are beautiful. His uh, Winslow Homer's Caribbean paintings are so on the Nassau Island paintings. I might be doing gorgeous. that this year, Adrian. And then you can <laughs> also that. have some of his Civil War p sketches and paintings because you've got your Winslow Homer Civil War paintings. And you know that as well. That's, when I'm curating which art pieces it's really hard because I have ones that I personally love, but then I don't 
know if they've if they have the same historical impact that others were when just going back for a second, when you were talking about uh, how as like an art teacher, you grade them because that has been a struggle for me. Um, I'm a praiser and aesthetics. One thing that I could find with this particular student is that I like how he chose what needed to be exact and what needed to be, um, what could be different? You can still tell that this is Mona Lisa. Uh, Mona Lisa. Yeah, exactly. Um, you can still tell this is the Arnold Fini portrait. He knew the things, and he included the mirror because the mirror is very important in the Arnold Fini yep. portrait. Um, and so, he knowing which things to include and exclude would be something that I would praise this student on. Uh, or, look at that or, School you know, of Athens that he did down there too. Yeah, that you can recognize it. I can. It's just a if sketch. Do, and... Yeah. If I were to, to you know, push him to an, another level, I would probably say find a way to, um, you know, highlight which ones are his friends and which ones are representing um, Socrates, et cetera, you know. Mm-hmm. Uh, so that, that would be perhaps something I would do. Um, what? is this one this page is just stunning oh, goodness the wave the, yeah and that's... then it's so funny it's got like this little smiley face right here <laughs> so casper david friedrich is um oh love him love him oh, yes oh thank you he's and i i did not know of him until i studied uh until until i was teaching art and I just felt the romantic period, which of I you can tell that my kids, I mean, either everybody just loves the romantic period or they just have followed my love for it. But a lot oh. of them would put my favorite era. I have to go to one of the students who it's did that. It's probably my favorite era as well. You know, I have oh, to tell you how I discovered Casper David Friedrich. I oh. um I didn't know him, but I was writing curriculum for responsive ed and I was looking for art because I was put all kinds oh, of sure. art around all the lessons and all of the text stories I gave them. And I did some, I was in wiki art, probably doing just a word search, trying to find a specific kind of painting. And when I came across that image, I had never seen it before. And it, that the image of the man looking out over the, over the the fog, fog. Mm -hmm. as soon as I saw it, I sat back in my chair. It took my breath away. And I just sat there and stared at the painting for like five minutes. And I called one of my colleagues over and I was like, look at this painting. Like it just literally took my breath away. And I I had never seen it before. I had never heard of him before, but that painting is so captivating. It just, whatever he did in that painting, it, it literally takes your breath away. And you're like, wow. What's beautiful is that what he did was capture to me, the, the religious aspect of the romantic period. Like we have the period where it's just like, you, you know, the romantics that are just like nothing matters and live life. But um, he was an, a naturalist and a Christian and he would go out and enjoy nature, not just enjoy nature, but the, you know, the intent was to sit in it and to feel small and to see the, oh, oh, um, there's a word that I'm looking for right now that is quoted in C.S. Lewis and he's discussing, can a waterfall be, finish this for me, Adrian, do you know what I'm talking it's, about? Is it in Abolition of Man, the sublime? Yes. Sublime. Mm-hmm. So this is, this is Casper David Friedrich, you know, experiencing the sublime yes. and, and being small in that, um, which I think is seeing things that are bigger than us is such an important part of our growth as humans. We can't believe we're bigger than everything else. Let me, and every single one of his, you'll notice every single one of his artworks like this. Look, it's oh, always I love like that. A, yes. See, oh, oops. Give the me wanderer second. above the sea of fog. So it's another fog. Oh, he loves fog. I huh? don't think that was that. I, I don't think that was the same. I don't think it was either. These, that was a moon. These are all, I know these are the, Casper David Friedrich. So do you see how they're all looking? Um, I'm trying, let me find the chalk clips again. Here we go. So this is of he and his wife and his friend. And I have this in our house. What's uh, that one called? This is his chalk 
clips uh, on Rugen. Okay. Let's see if this pulls it up bigger. Oh goodness. Come there oh. we go. Uh, this, and I oh, I just love it. This is so the um, wanderer above the sea of fog is really brings you to a place of I think questions perhaps. I mean, for it's a sure. different form of viewer. Um, but for this one, this gave me such peace. And so I wanted to put this in our home because I was like, this to me is looking out on the peace and beauty of what God has created. And then also doing so as a family and with a little bit of fun, like he's dropped his hat. And um, so I think he's so beautifully captured it. The, the You don't see the viewer's faces. They're always very small in this big nature setting. The um, other so one you had pulled up was a full moon one, I think. Is I can't yeah. remember. I feel like moon is in the title of that one. I um there, that one. I forget yeah. what that one's called. Two yeah. men contemplating, contemplating the, moon. the moon. Yes. I knew moon was in the title. <laughs> I love this and that's a just good gorgeous you. picture of a full moon. We have this like it in what he chose like he it could be the castle but it's this little fir tree with the cross oh and, i love that access, i mean we could just go into this i see all you day. know it's funny my daughter my old my oldest daughter uh second born but oldest daughter she recently told me that he is her favorite artist and she bought his book and it's nice. funny to me because we never studied him in our homeschool i didn't oh, know yeah. who he was but no. she, but she has studied him so that tells me like oh the charlotte mason education i gave her worked because she buys books yes. of, of artists that she likes and i'm yes. feel a little bit happy that i didn't totally fail her <laughs> that has been something that i've really enjoyed I, I had a wonderful group of students this year and and they would uh you know go and and find artists from contemporaries of the artists that we were learning and tell me about them. Um, and I was like, and so I was learning from my students. So they were like, and they would come to me in, in, you know, some of them in humility, some of them in showing off, but uh, asking about it. So here, here are his American pages where he has them lined out here. So it is inspiring the students to go look at the artists and yes, see more pieces. Hope. I have a question. Did, when, you, love, fall in love. when you show yes, a picture I mean. like the Frederick Casper one of the man looking yes. out over the fog, yes. do you just like let them look at it for a minute and then tell back what they notice or do you teach them about it or do you do a little bit of both? I, I would say I start um, it, it depends. Sometimes I if there's something that I think is going to, it depends on the piece. It depends on the artist. That's, that's okay. what I would say. So um, sometimes I give them a little bit of background about the artist um, before we go into the artworks of the artists or similarly the piece of music. Um, and sometimes I just play the piece of music or I show the piece of artwork with no clues as to what they're learning about. And I let them get there. Uh, and I think kind of varying that helps keep them on their toes as well uh, mm -hmm. in how they're learning. I think you're right. I see uh, you so have uh, teaching um, Hopper's artworks. I'll show a lot of them back to back to back. Um, and I did so similarly with Casper David Friedrich um, so that they could see how the individuals were portrayed and how they're, they're all in these rooms and and they would notice things that i didn't even notice they noticed that all of they're like they're all in green rooms why are they all in green rooms interesting they're all like yeah. you know they they notice these things they do um, I, and so and we get to look into them i gotta tell you the frederick casper painting of the man looking over the fog you know yeah. what it reminds me of and this is going to sound weird but it reminds me of the story to me it captures the whole essence of the story, Frankenstein. Oh, my husband is reading that right now. And yes. After I have not he, oh, wait, don't tell him I said that. But after he finishes yes. reading it, okay. put that picture out and ask him, what do you notice about this painting? <gasps> see if, he, see if he ties in. So that means he can't listen to this podcast until he's done reading, reading Frankenstein. Okay. I just, it captures Frankenstein to me. It captures the whole book, all of it. I, 
missing a page right now, so I'm going to have to bring it up it, right now. I and it makes me, it. was Frankenstein written before or after that painting? And do you think that Frederick Casper had read the book? And that's something that you would put in your own book of centuries, Adrian. Like my question. That's, that's yeah, so my wondering question. And that's what Dave, uh, yeah. John Muir Law says, is always put your questions. I wonder if, and so that's my wonder question about that. Um, I, oh, I want to bring up this real quick and then I'll go back to because I want to show something that one of my students did that was is just so fun. So this is here we go. Mm -hmm. This is what some others this is what they would look like. This is examples, I think, from uh, Charlotte Mason uh, PNEU students from the students that Charlotte Mason. Yes. From Ambleside students. Yes. Yeah. Well, so this first one is from one of her students. Um, and then these following ones are from more modern students, mm -hmm. uh, like pro current day. Um, so I'm going to go back to the video. Stop sharing. Are we back to just that? Yes. Okay. Um, so I wanted to show this one students because it cracked me up. Um, and it shows how it becomes personal for them. She fell in love on her own. We were not reading Dostoevsky in middle school, but she fell in love with Dostoevsky uh, through kind of learning other things that point to Dostoevsky. And so in the romantic, here we go. This is, you can see, give me a second. So, so eighth grade, did she go home and read period. one of his books on her own? Yes. Yeah, she oh, chose to wow. read one of her books. So this is the classical period. Notice there's not... Or, or now I should say, this is the romantic period. Like My number all... one era, she says. Yeah. Yes. And she has put, um, she's put his fake death in here. She's put his real death. Like she has added all these things and then other things that she loved. Like so she fell in love with some of these artists as well. And so she's added extra information. Oh, that artist in the them. middle. The artist in the middle. That piece. I want to buy that piece and hang it here in this room that I'm in. It would. <laughs> oh, it would look so good in Wouldn't there. it? I need that piece. I forget who is that. Who no, painted that? No, I actually because it's, we. I'm pretty sure um, it's a late, a female artist. I have to find it. I I found it a I few actually, months ago. And it's it's so funny that you would point out the one piece that I I don't remember. And <laughs> I don't either. But I know I can look her up. And it's spent as much as much time. It's, it's it wasn't actually in the curriculum, but I was like, my God, I do a little bit of it. Um, but she even at the end added an addendum of just interesting things she learned about Dostoevsky. I love and she that. Read, she hasn't read, read Brothers K, but... Um, this is so such a good a example. At the, at the back, so that we have an addendum. And one of the things that I think I like about having the students make them... Hers, hers was not as, as complete in that area. You can tell where her love was. Um, and I kind of love a student like that, I'm not going to lie, who doesn't care about the A, but cares about learning. Um, and she, she's definitely one of those. Well, but I think I, it's, these are good yeah. examples. You're showing us really great examples of how this you have allowed yourself to step back and provide opportunities for the students to really make it their own. You've given With the guidance. Any, I, you've done yeah. a lot of, you've given them opportunities to uh, do mimetic learning through yeah. mimesis mm -hmm. but then you've also stepped back and allowed through that mimetic example you've given them to imitate you've stepped back and allowed them to make it their own and that is exactly classical education and charlotte mason that's exactly yeah, where they come great. together yeah yeah thank you I, I knew i needed to have you on my podcast because i Aww. just think <laughs> i think that you the, want to learn how to make it now mm -hmm. you want to learn how to make the ones we yes have made. No. Yes, okay, so as best as you can. <laughs> as best as I can and as quickly as I can because, you know, we don't have two days on this. This so is going to be I, a long podcast episode know, because I'm there's sorry. so much to talk about. <laughs> we, we just needed to catch up anyway. And, yeah, we both love it. So um, I let the kids uh, choose from, and they can bring their own too, but choose from scrapbook paper, uh -huh. their covers. Um, I recommend getting one that's a little more. I noticed the students who used the thinner ones, they fell, fell apart a little easier. So they're getting a thicker cardstock helps. Um, so you get a page like this, you cut it down to the size of your cardstock. And I recommend using cardstock because you're gonna be writing these, writing on these 
um, regularly throughout the year and you don't want uh, to lose it or to, for it to get destroyed. So they basically are like eight and a half by 11 books. These are. Yes. 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 Yeah. yeah. So they yeah. have, get, you get your cardstock, um, figure out how you're going to do it. Are you going to do it by century? Are you going to do it by time period? Um, I think, you know, if you're just teaching American history, perhaps you can consolidate some of these earlier years because they're very important um, and then have like more space for your American years. If you're doing this as a teacher, I don't think this is how Charlotte Mason would recommend doing a book of centuries at home, um, but this is how I've made it work for my class uh, and to take our time doing it. So you get your card stock, figure it out, put it on your uh, scrapbook paper, cut it down to size. So I've done that here. Mm -hmm. Fold, fold your card stock, and then you're going to cut. If you're doing, I, I think stitching it would be a great way, but I actually love doing it with just a string tie method because then it makes it very easy to switch out pages and to add pages. So if, you know, my student who loved the romantic period wants to add more to the romantic period, then all she needs to do is come ask me for another piece of cardstock, um, and then she can add that in right next to it. Okay. In so she can okay. add pages to her book. Okay. And one idea I've thought about if I'm doing my own child, like at home's book of century, is having one, having a page by page for each year so that they can look back and they still have the centuries from, you know, the beginning of time till today, but then they can look at them from each year they learned about these centuries and see the differences in mm -hmm. their own growth in addition to how they all fit in the grand scheme of the story of the world. But anyway, those are just ideas. I haven't done it yet. But then uh, what kind have, of string do you use for stitching? How do you do the I stitching? Use wine. And I think that is, I've used thread in the past. Um, mm -hmm. I don't recommend using yarn or anything that has a pull. You just want it to make sure it doesn't, you know, it's yes. when you pull on it, there's no give. Okay. Um, so you cut. I gave my, this is an area where, you know, I give, you have to do it this way because I've realized it works better this way. Um, so I didn't actually, in modeling this, I was just going quick just to give you guys a, an example, but an inch, or I think really a half an inch is the best. So half an inch on each on side. On the crease at the top and the bottom. You cut it. On the crease okay. on the top and the bottom. And then you center it on your... Uh, scrapbook paper that's already been cut and you go down because your scrapbook paper is going to lip over it a little bit you see mm -hmm. I see um, it so yes you make sure that the cut goes to where the cut would go on your uh, inner papers then you put your papers in this is another thing you do not you do not put them inside each other even though that would make it for your book of centuries, it's going to make more sense to put them next to each other like this, because then you can add pages. Okay. Which is exciting. And if you make a mistake, like let's say you are gluing on a piece and then it just absolutely destroys the whole page and you have to start over. Like you can take this page out and then put a replacement page. In. Okay. Um, and so for something that you're adding to, I think it's nice to give it space to be added to. Mm -hmm. um, so putting the pages in side by side is, is I believe key to making this type of book of centuries. And then you get your string and you wow. go around like this. And there are some tips and tricks to tying a tight, uh, string without like ripping your paper but just pulling as as tight as you can and then um you just tie a knot honestly okay and if a student wants to add cut. paper mm -hmm. you would cut that add the paper and put a new string on if they wanted to replace this the paper they could cut it if they want to add it they just add a new string so each of these oh add another uh, string 
-hmm. Yeah, oh, so each okay. page has its own stream. Oh, I see. This one was not done very well, but it's great because I can show. Let me go to one that was here. Look how nice this looks. That, wow. And the one of the one of the books that I've seen other um, homeschool moms do has they're the little moleskin type books, and I, I have I was, one of those. Yeah, yes, and I love those. Um, I I just like I want I'm like a hoarder of moleskin books. Like just like put them all in. Um, one of the ones that isn't like leather bound, but just folded. Mm -hmm. uh, They'll have one of those for like their commonplace book, for their, um, you know, nature study book, and then for their book of centuries. And then they have a bigger leather bound book, uh, sort of folder almost, that has a clasp over it. And then the elastic goes around their book so they can take their books out of that bigger thing that's collecting them all. And I think that's really cool, mm -hmm. which I had have to shout out Mariah Martinez. Um, she did, I haven't made a commonplace book, but she did a commonplace book with her students um, this year to collect quotes from books they were reading. And I think, I think that would be really interesting to learn about. <laughs> yes, it's good. That's good. And one of the books I would recommend to our listeners is The Living Page by Lori Best Vader. And yeah. it has a ton of ideas for all different kinds of notebooks. It's it's a very, very good resource for how to get started in notebooking and all the different kinds that uh, Charlotte Mason recommends. It's so, so much fun. <laughs> yeah, it really is. Another, um, so I wish I had an exact resource. I bought one and I forgot. I don't know where it is at the moment. It's at school somewhere. Um, but you can, you can purchase uh, Book of Centuries histories that have already been created. Um, where you can see like lots and lots and lots of history and pull those if you just need something as a resource to pull or even for the kids to just sit down and be like, Ooh, this is fun. This is great. Yeah. Kind of like yeah. an encyclopedia of book of yes. century yes. timeline yeah. just yeah. to look at. Yeah. That's interesting too. Oh, uh, well, thank you. This was amazing. And I'm really, thank really so happy much. that you took a lot of time to share all of this with us. I think it's going to be very, very helpful for, for, for our listeners to, to uh, learn so. a lot. So always and if they have tips, I would like, you know, I'm still learning. <laughs> yeah. And we'll put as much in the show notes as we can. Um, our listeners always like to hear my yes. closing question. So what is a book you wish you had read sooner in your life or a quote that has had an impact on you? I thought about this question and it was, I would say difficult to think of one. I don't think I have a book that I wish I had read earlier in my life, but I do have a book that I have read earlier in my life that is different every time I read it. And that's The Little Prince. And so I love, I love returning to that book every six years or so. I love that. You know, I think you might be the first podcast guest who has ever said The Little Prince. And I have to say, I had never read The Little Prince until like two years ago. And I was blown away. I bawled my way through the book. Yes. Yes. <laughs> well, you read it as a child and you read it as a child would read it. It's this fantasy. It's, it's, you know, I, I would read it to go to bed. I didn't know it was depressing. <laughs> and then you read it as an adult. Um, I mean, I, I read it as a child, a teenager, an adult. And so now I need to read it as an adult with children because that's the next, I think. Well, I would say it's because all of those are in the book. They are. Yeah. 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 Yeah, uh, yeah. I that, if he knew what he like. This would be like that for his. Like a, oh like yeah! That. Now I'm gonna have to reread it. It's been a few years, but yeah, it's it's definitely a. a I'm impressed that you picked that one. That was good. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. All right. Well, I mean, thank I you. Say my favorite is Les Misérables, but then I feel like I can't say it because I haven't read The Unabridged. <laughs> oh, well, that would be quite a big uh, an undertaking. <laughs> Yeah, uh, <laughs> that would take well, me to I haven't read it and to, I'd have to live to be 500 to read it <laughs> yeah <laughs> I love the movies though oh my gosh yes so it's, I'm sure the book is better I'm sure 
Uh, and even that one, I, I must have chosen it because it's nostalgic in some way because I grew up on the music from Les Miserables. So oh, yeah. I thought that they were church songs because my mom sang them so often. So beautiful. I love it. it I have an album, a good old fashioned um, yeah. record. <laughs> is it the 10 year uh, anniversary one? Or is it original? It's probably older. The one that I have is old. Yeah. It's an old record. It's in great shape, though. Maybe it's worth a lot of money. <laughs> probably is. Probably sounds amazing, too. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you, Anna Marie. Thank you so much. It was so good to talk to you, and it was so good to be here. You, too. Thank you for listening. You can get involved in a few ways. There's a Facebook page where we actively discuss the ideas around classical education. You can find us on Facebook at facebook.com forward slash groups forward slash classical education. And if you want to help offset our production costs, you can support the podcast financially by going to www.classicaleducationpodcast.com forward slash support. As the great artist and educator John Ruskin once said, Well, my friends, the final result of the education I want you to give your children will be in a few words this. They will know what it is to see the sky. They will know what it is to breathe it. And they will know best of all what it is to behave under it as in the presence of a father who is in heaven. <laughs>